For this session, we have very purposely combined two very different projects. Um, they're both two of London's newest timber projects, but one very much uses traditional um, green oak construction, um, and the other one um, is very much using modern engineered glue lamb construction. So really, we're, you know, we're looking at wood, our oldest construction material, and we're just trying to show how it has developed from medieval times through to the present day. So to start, I would like to invite up John Greenfield. Um, we're very lucky to have John here. He has um, been involved in the Globe Theatre project for nearly uh, 20 years, uh, nearly 30 years actually. Um, so he really knows it better than anybody else. So he'll be talking about the Globe and also the recent a building he's put up there, which is the Sam Monoaka Theatre. Thank you. Uh, I've got two amalgamated talks, actually, because I think uh, there were two things going on in my mind when we were first asked to do this. And one was uh, about why you do reconstructions and, and why one does something strange like looking back 400 years and using the technology from then uh, these days. So you'll see a couple of uh, different themes going through what I'm saying. And too many slides, uh, so I will... <laughs> I'll try and get through them as, um, as quickly as I can. I think the first thing I wanted to note is that the globe really is unique. It's, it's a one-off. And uh, one of the main reasons why uh, th there was a great move to reconstruct it, of course, is because of its uh, association with Shakespeare and, and Shakespeare's significance as, as a cultural icon uh, in the English-speaking world. Um, and that cultural significance is something that I find quite interesting because if you, if you look around the world and see some other uh, places where reconstructions have taken place, uh, they, they, they touch a kind of uh, a communal soul that we have. Uh, this is central Warsaw uh, after World War II and uh, the destruction that took place there, almost total destruction. And um, this is it... Uh, Really, very soon afterwards, it was almost one of the first things that the, the Polish people did was to, <clears throat> when they were faced with so many other things that needed rebuilding, and indeed Warsaw was, is a very modern city, but the central square, which was, was considered to be the, the heart of, of the Polish nation, uh, was rebuilt uh, in, in the 40s and early 50s. Uh, similarly, there's the uh, more recent example in the <clears throat> early 1990s, uh, the, the bridge at Mostar, which of course suffered uh, during the, 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 the more, most recent Balkan War. <coughs> a 15th century bridge, which um, the various ethnic cleansing that took place there, <coughs> excuse me, meant that the uh, Muslim population, the European Muslim population, was, was pushed over onto one side of the river. And uh, at one point in the war, uh, the, the um, Bosnian Croatians uh, shelled it and shelled it absolutely and completely to destruction. So, so the bridge disappeared. Four years later, it's been rebuilt again so that the picture that you saw first of all was, was only taken uh, a, a month or so ago and, and the bridge is, is rebuilt and a very important symbol of trying to repair some of, some of the hurt uh, that, that was suffered at, at that time. So it's those kind of issues, really, that, that led... Uh, this is Sam Wanamaker. Um, some of those sort of deep cultural significances that led to a, a project like Rebuilding the Globe. Sam here has come over from uh, the US, himself actually a political, political refugee because he was uh, uh, forced out by the MacArthur trials uh, and uh, he came to London to see what there was that celebrated Shakespeare and all he found was this plaque that you can see behind and he thought that we'd done such a bad job of, of celebrating uh, Shakespeare's uh, birthplace that he set about uh, uh, he, this um, uh, reconstruction uh, project and this is Theo Crosby partner at Pentagram Design Limited who was my boss until his death in 1994. Uh, three years before we completed the globe. So uh, I was fortunate enough to, to take over from him and, and push the project further on. Uh, 
the, the, the subtext in, in what I uh, had put on, in the title was of, um, of reimagining Bankside because uh, Crumbs, I, I left London for about 10 years a little while ago and came back and boy, had it changed in those 10 years. Well, it's, you know, you look at somewhere like Bankside and um, you can chart how much it's changed there. Uh, this is it, uh, obviously, down uh, on the um, South Bank. And it's, um, it's very much the, uh, the part of London. It was a liberty and uh, it was a rural area. And, of course, it's moved on now. This was taken in 1926. And you can see the urbanisation of, of the same area uh, into what I would call an industrial landscape. And then, more recently, a photo taken in 1995 shows it uh, with the, the globe reconstruction uh, underway here. Uh, that's what I would call a post-industrial landscape because uh, all the rope making works and all of the, uh, the wharves have completely disappeared. Uh, so coming from this, this was a sort of a, a pictorial reconstruction of what Bankside had been like. And then seeing as it, as it is now and seeing what a theatre land it had been. You know, 400 years ago, there was playhouse after playhouse that had been built uh, in, in Bankside. And, um, and our project to reconstruct the globe was, was built away from uh, its original site, but very close to, to, to capture that um, significance of, um, of, of Bankside and Shakespeare's workplace. Um, you can see on the, on the globe site that there are two, uh, two theatres. There's, there's the globe, which is an open air theatre, and there is the, uh, what at the time was called the Inigo Jones Theatre uh, because we had some drawings which we thought were by Inigo Jones that were the, the basis of, uh, of that reconstruction. And it gave us an indoor playhouse which, although very different in size, I'm afraid these two aren't, aren't to scale. This is a, a very much smaller theatre holding about uh, 340 people as opposed to 1,500 people in the globe. But it's got very much the same uh, parts. It's got a, a pit and the stage with a Francine, a, a, a fixed back wall, which you'll see a bit later on, uh, uh, made in timber. And of course, the galleries that, that, that surround the yard. So they're two uh, very uh, similar uh, buildings. And these were, these were the drawings that we had, which we thought were Inigo Jones, but le later scholarly work uh, showed that these were the work of John Webb, who was Inigo Jones' uh, assistant. And, um, and we did um, just those two drawings. That's all there is. And we think they were from about 1660, so they are much later, actually, than our period, which was around about uh, 1600. And there's not time to go into it now, but we did uh, quite a bit of careful historic, oops, historic analysis and uh, geometric analysis to, uh, to try and find out the secrets that were hidden in the drawings. And there were all sorts of confounding things, like you can see one here, that the columns that form the inner gallery are set out on a seven-sided figure, and the... Um, masonry that surrounds it set out on an eight-sided figure which is a real curious thing which I don't think we ever understood why they did that but that, that was something that was hidden in the drawings. But that led us uh, to, to come up with the plan that we reconstructed which is this one here and you can see immediately, sorry I keep pressing the wrong button, that, uh, that the inner gallery instead of being curved in the reconstruction we've made as a series of uh, facets. Uh, and that is really very much part of the timber engineering, which is the part that I'd like to talk about next. The, the way that uh, Elizabethan and early Jacobean buildings were put up was, was very much using this kind of uh, straight timber technology. And I think maybe you can also see in, in here that we were able to, because we added this uh, fire escape corridor around the outside, we were able to, to form a timber frame inside the masonry shell and, and have for ourselves a, a traditional timber frame that we could then uh, work on in the traditional way. Uh, and and that, that, that's the frame itself. Um, what we use, of course, in, in this kind of work, which I think is the contrast you'll see with, uh, with the later project, is very much uh, hand tools. Uh, 
It's, it's, it's a totally handcrafted building. Uh, so you have the ads here and the side axe, which is used, the side axe is a particular tool using for, used for squaring off uh, circular timbers. And this is Peter McCurdy here, who was the specialist timber framer who built the globe, demonstrating to Sam Wanamaker how you do uh, straighten off the edges of, of a, a, a sawn circular timber. And uh, you can, Sam is stepping back there with the sort of uh, uh, wood chips flying away from, from the side axe as Peter's working it. And, and the result is, uh, is a very complex frame. I think we're going to see an even more complex frame later on. But, but, but uh, although these are very simple and straightforward techniques you use in, in traditional construction, what you can build up to is, is a, a very complex uh, network of timbers. And the way it's done, the, the strict method of working uh, on a timber frame is, is to resolve the, the framework itself into a series of two-dimensional elements. So you build up a, a three-dimensional frame from two-dimensional elements. And you can see here that uh, the wall plates and the beams at wall level, uh, at uh, roof level, form a two-dimensional frame in themselves. And also the sill plates form a two-dimensional frame. And the back wall forms a two-dimensional frame. So the, the carpenters, when they work in their yard, are always working on these two-dimensional frames, and they always work on them flat, about two foot six off the ground, because that's a sort of anthropometric height to work on things. And they, and they scribe all the timbers together to make these, these, uh, these two-dimensional elements, which are then cut together into, into the three dimensions. And the method of joining the timbers is what we call scribing. And you can see here what uh, um, the craftsman's doing here is projecting the shape of this timber, which is not truly square. I mean, that's the thing about working with, with hand-formed timbers, is that, that there might be one true plane, which might be uh, the top one here, but, but all of the other surfaces might not be truly 90 degrees from that. And really, uh, Julian here is projecting the shape of that timber down onto this one, so he can form a joint and very tight joints are formed in that way, but absolutely unique joints. So there will be a very similar looking joint a little bit further around the frame from this, but you cannot interchange the timbers because they've all been scribed in this way, very particularly for the location that they, uh, they're meant to go in. I think that's making the point again. You can see the, start to see the two dimensional frames that you would, if you were a, a timber craftsman, would start to, to work on within that. And some of those frames uh, become very complex and some of them become um, decorated as well. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that uh, later on. But if you had in your mind those, those two-dimensional frames, this is them now laid out in the carpenter's yard. So that there is a back wall frame and I believe uh, so is that one there. And um, you can see the process that's going on here where they're trying to cut this timber here into the frame below. So again, they've set up the timber and where it's not square, they've, they've made this top face absolutely horizontal using wedges and blocking pieces. So they can then go through this process of, of scribing that down into the frame. And, and because it's a polygonal shape, this again is the back wall and you're looking here at a post that's a vertical post, or will be a vertical post in the final frame, uh, how uh, all of the, the shaping uh, of that back wall uh, is, is accommodated with, within that framing. And, and you can imagine that these timbers will then be taken apart and put off to one side and they'll make the next two-dimensional frame, and that would be the timber that would, would actually fit into this point here. So by working around the whole frame in this method, they pick up every single joint off-site uh, in two dimensions, uh, and not until you get to site is the whole thing put up actually finally in 3D. Those are the, uh, the, the prepared timbers uh, off to one side wait, waiting to be reworked. And, uh, and of course each joint, for the reason I said before, because each joint is unique, they all have to be numbered. And uh, for speed on this one, because it wasn't going to be seen, they used a felt pen. 
but uh, I think a lot of people know on, on uh, traditional buildings you see uh, chisel cut numbers, usually Roman numerals, cut in. And they're saying something like, this is bay four uh, top joint on the left, so that, so that you, you can reference the, the joint when you, uh, when you get back to it. But uh, the frame uh, that we made for the Wanamaker Playhouse was highly decorated because it was uh, uh, intended to be a reconstruction of 1616 when this sort of very flamboyant Jacobi, uh, Jacobian decoration was in full flow. And there's, there's a few uh, lovely uh, examples of this kind of carving around that we wanted to, uh, to emulate. Uh, this is a building that doesn't exist anymore. This was Oxford Inn in the uh, centre of the city of London. But uh, there were uh, daguerreotype uh, Victorian photos taken of it. So there's, there's quite a nice uh, photographic record of a building that, that disappeared over 100 years ago that we were able to look at. And I'd like you just to keep in mind the look of the, of the post and its shaping and how it returns to, to that shape. And these, I'll flick through these quite quickly, but uh, it's, it's just to give a flavour of the kind of richness of handcrafted decoration. And it's not just applied. It, it's, uh, you'll find a lot of these are actually structural posts which have been, uh, while they were in the workshop, have been, been carved and worked uh, uh, you know, in a decorative way as well as a structural way. And I think you can see that quite nicely here, that the, these are the sort of posts that we were seeing in the workshop before. You can see the, uh, the, um, the pegs, because all the joints are pegged um, using a method they call uh, draw boring, which is where you, uh, you drill a, a hole in the mortise and a hole in the tenon, which are offset from one another purposely by three or four millimetres. And then as you drive a tapered peg in, it, it pulls the joint very close together, giving you these these very sharp lines. But of course, everything here has also been uh, highly carved as well. Uh, and some of it, you know, really very beautifully carved. And, uh, and there's, there's also lots of different timbers that are used. So uh, this paneling is uh, elm paneling that's set within an oak frame. So, so in working in this way, you really have to know your timbers and, and know how they work together and know how they're gonna shrink and, and, and move. Uh, and this, this was, uh, if, you've, if you've remembered what we were looking at with the column earlier on, you can see here it's all cut from one piece. So, so the whole process of decoration is what you might call a reductive method. Uh, a lot of uh, later decoration was built up by putting lots of different uh, shapes together, uh, you know, the, the, the typical classical shapes. But actually the way the Jacobeans and Elizabethans worked was to take a block of timber and to, and to cut the shape from it, o often slightly crudely because the publishing of the, of the Renaissance books was still uh, not, not as, as, as perfect reproductions as they might be. But, but I just wanted you to see how you really have a, a post size here, which is then even reduced further. And there was quite a lot of engineering that went into understanding the thickness of this turned column at the point where it had its maximum load. Uh, it was also bored down the middle uh, with a hole to, to try and stop the, the splitting and checking of the timber to some degree. Uh, and, and of course, it, it's integrated with the jointing. So these, these columns have just come back from uh, the turner. So they were cut to shape in the workshop, turned to a circle, and then... Um, shaped at the end so that the, the turned columns were then given their various uh, mortises and tenons to fit them uh, into the frame. And I think that this is quite a nice thing to see that, you know, one part of the quality of the handmade work is the tooling. I think the carving that we saw before, uh, you can see the chisel marks, you can see the energy of the guys who, who did it. Here you can see the marks uh, on the lathe. Uh, we didn't use a, a Jacobean lathe, but we had a modern lathe slowed down to the speed that it, that it would have been at if it had been uh, hand propelled, as it were. And, uh, and these are the gouge marks of the, uh, of, of the cutting tool on, on the lathe. And that, these are the um, columns that we made. Uh, and that's the example from history that, that we were copying. So I, I hope you can see that in this, we, we, we captured some of the, the uh, craft energy uh, of, of um, some of the examples we were following. 
and um, these are other elements of decoration. And I really will go through this very quickly because, of course, what, what we did to the frame as well after that, which is horror to most people these days, is we then painted it, or painted a lot of it, uh, and painted it in a way that was fictive. And these examples here, which are Italian, but there are many examples in the UK as well, are, are all wood. This is all wooden paint and looks extremely convincingly like stone. All of these are, are, are built up sections of timber. Um, and there's a lovely energy too in the way that the painters work, uh, you know, simple brush strokes, not, not fine work, but very, very energetic. Uh, and, and lots of examples of, of these as well, just, just, just uh, uh, some of it very fine painting and some of it, uh, as I say, quite, quite crude. And this was the ceiling, there's, the, there's quite a few Jacobean examples left in, in Scotland and this was a whole ceiling that we used uh, as the basis for the ceiling at the Wanamaker. And all the pigments that we researched, they of course were all hand ground, earth pigments, uh, metal uh, oxide pigments. And they, uh, the, the, the way that these craftsmen worked as well was, was to be given a, a woodcut of the time of an image, which they then themselves, you can see he's got it in his hand there as he's, as he's working, different image, but, uh, but, but working from, you know, there's a real process of skill from there through there on, on, onto there. And uh, the, this was the ceiling of the Wanamaker Playhouse uh, in production with gold leaf and paint. Uh, same chap actually, uh, 15 years later doing the painting. And this was the painting team who I think it's always worth um, celebrating. So the Francina is this, this back portion of the stage which is fixed there. So it's not like modern theatre where, where there's a constantly changing uh, scenery and, and scenes. You use your imagination to see uh, this kind of architecture as either a, a part of a forest or part of a palace or, or whatever it is the play is demanding of you. And um, a lot of work uh, went into this. This was the, really the architectural set piece that what we were working on. And these were the final uh, designs with a great deal of uh, gold uh, to highlight, gold, black and brown. Um, and that's the, that's the final thing. So this is the completed interior. And you can see the, the painted ceiling with this uh, gold leaf sunburst around picking up because this, the, the, the unique thing about this theatre is that all the productions are done by candlelight. And um, the gold leaf is, is, uh, is a great decorative uh, piece to, to pick up the very low light that we have in there. And, and all the carving that, that uh, went into all of these parts, of course, is all part of all the shadows that we need uh, for the modeling. And that was one of the production, the first production, Duchess of Malfi. And that's the kind of energy that, that, you, that you get at the Globe. So really, I think uh, what, what the nice thing I was trying to get across was that uh, it's the power of uh, not only building handcrafted buildings, but also having uh, handcrafted players on the stage uh, showing their acting craft, which I think has been part of the energy that has transformed Bankside. As a, as a contrast, um, I'll now talk about, this is the, the newest uh, engineered timber project in London. Uh, this opened literally three weeks ago. It is the, mm, well, not sure about the largest, but it is certainly the longest timber roof in the UK. Uh, it is the length of a cross-rail train. Uh, the cross-rail trains won't run for a couple of years, but um, there is now a public park which is, um, which is under this roof. Um, now, I'll start here. Um, seven years ago, I was called to the top of Canary Wharf Tower. I guess this is the pinnacle of your career when you finally get called to the top of the, to meet. And um, because, of course, Canary Wharf um, Limited, um, everything they do is very much sort of uh, concrete steel. Um, and this suggestion from uh, Foster's um, that the, the roof over the station might actually be a timber roof was, should we say, a little bit scary for, for Canary Wharf. It was, th th they simply didn't, they didn't understand the material. And, and they, they got me in there and they showed me these pictures and they said, will this last 60 years? 
You know, that was really all, all they, you know, we, we all have this instinctive feeling that wood rots, doesn't it? Um, the, now, so I looked at this, and of course, the, the key thing in this image is that you can see that's not a completely covered roof. There are holes in that roof, uh, which is rather nice because it allows the trees inside to grow out through them. But of course, those holes will also allow in rain. Um, so this was the question, exposed to rain, would this roof last 60 years? Um, now, I think if you're thinking about timber structures outside in the rain, then a really good um, thing to think about is, is bridges. Um, this um, is a, one of the most famous timber bridges built in, in southern Germany in the 1980s. Those are very long, continuous glue lamb beams, all, all glued together on site. I always tell people you shouldn't do site gluing because you can't get the QA right, but they did it here very carefully. Um, so those are literally hanging there like a giant um, washing line, if you like. Um, and um, this is the original photo of, of, of that bridge from, I think it was 1984. Um, and um, this, you, you can see the, um, uh, you know, the, the German engineers were not stupid. They knew that um, if you want wood to last, you really have to keep it dry. So what they've done is they have uh, used essentially the deck to, as, a, as a roof over the timbers. Um, and then what they said was, well, the, the sides of these glue lamb beams, are, they are exposed to the rain, but of course they're vertical faces, so the rain will just sort of run off quickly and the wood will stay dry. Um, you know, if you think about rot, rot is a fungus, so a fungus needs oxygen and water to survive. So if you can keep it dry, it will last forever. Um, now, um, I went to see this uh, about 10 years ago, it was. Um, and, uh, and in fact, what you'll see is that these, uh, these plates, plastic plates, have been added to the sides to keep the wood dry. Because what had happened was that um, the, there were, if I try and go backwards, um, you can imagine that there are various connection points um, where, so although, although most of the rain was washing off, those connection points that the water would track in along those bolts, uh, there were some nail plates as well, um, and they were finding that was starting to cause problems. Um, the, and so if, if we now come forward into uh, the uh, Canary Wharf, so uh, this was, uh, was a mock-up, but basically where there were timbers which were uh, framing those openings, um, what uh, we agreed with Fosters and, and with Vihag, who, who built it, John Smithall's going to speak in a moment, um, was that basically those timbers would be flashed with aluminium so that they were completely protected from the rain. So keep them dry and, and your roof will last for at least 60 years. It should really last forever. So this is the site. Um, it is, um, if you don't know Canary Wharf, this is basically one dock down from the Jubilee Line Station. And just like the Jubilee Line Station, it is constructed in the middle of the dock. Um, that is a cross-section through the station, so the crossrail trains come in at low level. This was a photo taken about four years ago, I think, during construction. Um, so um, there you can see being cut within the dock. Um, and this was the image which um, Foster's, it was Ben Scott at Foster's, uh, he was presented with this image. Um, basically, um, you've got the, the exits from the, uh, the crossrail station either end. There was to be a, obviously being Canary Wharf, there was to be a four-story shopping centre over the top. Um, and what um, Foster's were, were tasked with doing was really unifying this, so somehow unifying the station exits, the shopping centre. Um, and so this was what Ben came up with, and his image was to create really a ship that sat within the dock. And essentially what he was doing was he was wrapping the entire, um, if you like, the, the, the retail space, the exits from the station, in this one continuous roof. And the idea was that under that roof would be a public garden, um, and um, in that public garden would be all the plants which were brought in by the Victorian plant hunters into, into England. Obviously, if you go to Kew, you know, most of the plants you're looking at are not native English plants. And so this station runs east-west, and so at the east end, um, you will find the plants which were brought in from China, and at the west end, you'll find the plants which were brought in from the Americas. 
what material to make this out of. Um, the, the brief from Canary Wharf was very much they wanted something which would contrast with the, um, well, um, I can say it, which would contrast with the harsh steel and concrete architecture surrounding. Um, and hence this, this idea from Foster's very much for this sort of timber structure. Now, what's, what sort of structural form to go for? Um, now, I think it's really interesting. If you look, this is, um, you know, 1849. Um, the, um, this is the, uh, the, the one of the last um, uh, covered docks at Chatham. Um, but what you're looking at is you're looking at exactly the same form of construction um, which would have been used at the original globe that, that John's been talking about. So, and in, and in fact, really we've been using since Roman times. So it's really amazing that timber technology had not changed um, in probably about 2,000 years. In fact, the only change was that, of course, by 1849, we had essentially run out um, of, of, of timber. We're, you know, we wanted to create lots of farmland. Um, and so for more than 200 years, we've been importing most of our timber from, from, from Scandinavia. Um, and, and so here we'll have what, what is probably sort of old Scandinavia and Eastern Europe. So what you're looking at here is really Baltic and um, Baltic pine. But still, the jointing technology is very much the same as, as, as John talked about. Now, of course, if you want to start to create larger open spaces, um, the first large open spaces were the railway stations, um, and um, King's Cross was a very early one, only, in fact, two or three years after Chatham. Um, and they wanted large arches. Um, now, of course, um, uh, glue lamb had not yet been invented, um, and so King's Cross originally had timber arches, and these were bolt laminated arches because we didn't have the decent glues. So that image on the left shows you roughly what we're looking at, sort of staggered boards loosely bolted or tightly bolted together. Um, and on the right is an image of the original roof of, of King's Cross. And in fact, this uh, cast iron shoe is actually still there today. The, 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 the timber, for reasons which is actually not very well known, but, 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 but the timber has at some stage been replaced now with, with wrought iron arches. Now, of course, come forward just another three years to Paddington. Um, and, uh, of course, we've just had the Great Exhibition. Techniques have been invented for, for rolling wrought iron. And so immediately, that is a cheaper way to span the large space. Um, you can imagine that these were previously the bolt laminated arches, the, the traditional timber construction. Um, they're very clever ways of doing things, but they're very labor intensive. Um, and so really, the, the raw time became overnight a much cheaper way of, of spanning a large space. Now, what's, what's changed um, and means that now we can do much more economic timber structures is the, is the, the developments of gluing technology. This really happened during the Second World War. The mosquito was a very famous example, probably one of the, the first examples, really, of, uh, of waterproof timber glues being used. Um, and so that's what you see here now in this glue lamb beam. Um, that's those, those dark brown glue lines. I've purposely shown you this before the glue has been planed off, so you can see how it's been made. Um, and the point is that's a, that's a moisture waterproof glue. Um, and so um, now we can make much larger sections by gluing small pieces together. Um, now, one of the interesting things about glue lamb is because it's made out of lots of small planks, so those thin planks, they can be very quickly dried out in a kiln. So that's what's going on here. Um, that's why the, the planks are spaced apart. It takes about a week for those planks to be, to be dried out. Now, this is the big difference with the, the medieval technology, where we were working with um, balks of, of, of timber, um, oak in that case. Um, of course, those balks of timber are, even if you wanted to try and kiln dry them, it would be impossible. Um, they would take really months or years. Um, but of course, if you cut your wood up into thin planks, um, then all that natural moisture in the tree can be got rid of quite quickly. And that means that um, all of that drying shrinkage is happening in the kiln rather than happening in your finished building. Um, 
So in, in something like the, uh, the globe, of course, all that shrinkage really adds to the character. You get that wonderful fissuring, um, some of those clever techniques that John talked about, which was to bore a hole down the middle, which reduces some of that fissuring. Um, but in, certainly in a, in a Norman Foster building, um, you can imagine that perhaps um, slightly warped fissured sections don't quite fit into the, um, to, to, to the architectural aesthetic. Um, and, and hence this idea of sort of um, modern sort of engineered blue timber. Um, so this is an example. This is a, another case where you can use um, uh, green oak to, to add to the aesthetic. So this um, um, was with uh, actually Dixon Jones. Uh, this is the library at Darwin College in Cambridge. Um, but these were, again, these were balks of oak. Um, and very much part of the architectural idea was that those balks would dry out and fissure and that would, so that this out library would age very quickly and would quickly fit into a 800-year-old university. Now, the other innovation, which we've really only seen in the past, I would argue, 10 years coming into, into timber, is, is the development of steel jointing techniques. Um, and so, um, really, Portcullis House, Michael Hopkins, was a very early example of that, and, and, but actually using these steel connections to enable you to join lots of timbers coming together at a point. Um, and you can see that very much the same idea starting to develop it in this early sketch of Canary Wharf. Now, Foster's original concept was that that roof would actually wrap all the way around and would actually be, wouldn't, wouldn't actually touch the, 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 if you like, the floor of the garden. Um, and um, one thing we did was really, because you can imagine that roof would have actually sagged under its weight, so we actually used the, 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 that, that, that concrete slab to actually tie the arch together. Um, you can see, obviously, all these connections, because, uh, because it is a, a multi-connection system, all those connections, they need to be really stiff moment connections. Um, and they actually start to become a really important part of the architecture. The, um, so uh, that's, the, uh, that's the concept, essentially. And um, this was the, so, so in, in the original architectural concept, there were 900 connections. Um, and what I should say is that actually the economics of timber construction are very different from steel. Um, and basically in timber, most of the money goes into those connections, those fabricated steel connections, which have to still have to be sort of hand assembled to some extent. So if you can reduce the number of connections, you improve the economics. So that's what we did here. We basically, we opened out those um, triangular cells. Uh, we made them as large as we could to within the limits of the ETFE pillows that this is clad in. Um, and basically, we halved the number of connections and um, halved the number of members and really improved the economics on the structure. Um, now, this project was actually tendered as a design and build. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see how the three different fabricators uh, proposed tackling the connections. Um, and it, it kind of shows you the whole, the whole family of, of modern timber connections which you used. Um, so this was a Swiss uh, fabricator. And their proposal was to make these very stiff um, connections into the end of the timbers. Their proposal was to basically have steel plates which were slotted into the members. You can just about see the heads of the slots there. And then those plates were to be held in by lots of um, dowels, essentially, just steel rods. This was the, the German offering. Um, and the German offering was actually to do, um, this was the, I should say, this was the, uh, the fabricator who had very recently built the Metropole Parasol in Seville. Uh, this is a, a Merck in, in Munich. And um, so the Metropole Parasol, all the connections on that are actually glued in steel rods. Um, and so that's what they were proposing to do here and gives you a very hidden uh, connection there, basically. Again, this is metal parts to create the push-pull for the moment connection. The, um, and this was the, uh, the winning design from, from, from uh, VHAG. John Smithall is going to speak in a moment. Um, and um, John can correct me, but I think one of the reasons that, that this design won um, was that it's an incredibly economic way of making connections. And because what VHAG proposed was, was simply to have a steel end plate and simply to screw that with very long, modern self-tapping screws onto the end of the glue lamb beams. And you can imagine just putting in th those screws, they cost about a pound each. Um, and they, because they're self-tapping, you can literally put each one in in about 30 seconds, um, just with a hand drill. So that gives you a great economy of connections. Um, and so um, I'll leave you with that image. Um, but I think now to have this as a, as a timber structure, 
um, right in the heart of London, in the heart of Canary Wharf, I think is a great statement for what modern engineer wood can achieve. Um, anyway, I'll hand you over to John, who will talk you through um, how that entire roof was constructed. So Andrew's sort of very well uh, described the design process and what led to it. What I'll talk about is how we sort of perceived it from a manufacturer, delivery and installation perspective, really. And it's, it, it is a, one of these projects that doesn't come along very often. So it's, it's been a great one for us to be involved in uh, on there. It was very tempting just to put that uh, BBC program, the $15 billion railway, on and just sit down for 15 minutes, really, because it's very unusual to get a TV program about construction that doesn't have all disasters and people rowing. But from having been on the site numerous occasions, it really was like that, a very professional everyone really enjoying being part of it and seeing different trades, the way they all helped each other out was a real credit uh, on there. But instead I will just give you a bit of a flavour for it. Um, yeah, it's now called Crossrail Place there and as Andrew said, it is open. It's definitely worth going down there to see uh, on there. Normally these things are all hidden away but it's, uh, it's incredible to see a fully grown park really put uh, in there and it's, it is an amazing thing. Uh, so with the, the competition on there, it's all about the money, unfortunately, these days. And really the connection design we came out, economics was a big part of it, but aesthetically it had to work for the design team and the, and the client had to buy into it. So, you know, when we, part of this design competition, when we came up with our final node design there, it had to work financially, but also aesthetically. What we try and do always with Glulam is try and hide the steel away uh, rather than have it exposed. But in this case, they wanted to make a feature of it. So you can see on that, it's a very complicated, you know, something like 450 or whatever nodes. Uh, and all but two of them, I think, were different. So it's with modern design technology, you're able to fabricate these really complicated connections uh, on there. As you say, the use of screws is something that's not, is only now sort of UK engineers are starting to accept. Quite often you'll get a lot of resistance from people that expect to see really huge agricultural industrial bolting and we suggest a few screws, it sort of raises a few eyebrows uh, on there. Uh, I mean VHAG, we're an Austrian company and we have our own design office with about 25 people in and we make glue lamb uh, and we also, as well as designing and make it, we also put it up. So we've been around since so sort of middle of the 19th century, started glue lamb in the, doing it in the 50s uh, and been working in the UK for several years. Um, but most of the projects we've been doing have been out in the sticks. So it's been really nice to do a big one in the, the heart of the capital uh, for all to see. Yeah, it's all about the detail. Uh, and really one of the key things, you try and make as much stuff as you can off site. Because as soon as you hit site, you lose control. Uh, of so many factors, so you do as much prefabrication, so when they come to site, they're not cutting any timber, all they're doing is bolting things together, and that makes such a difference, not only in cost, but in safety and speed and waste. You know, there's no, with us, there's just a bit of packaging, there's no cutting, and so, because it's in the heart of the financial district, you don't want to have a lot of banging and noise going on for the residents. So with this, it's a very quiet operation there. Um, the sort of very Germanic anal detail that they go into with the detailing, they say this building had to be guaranteed to last for a certain amount of time. So they went into the looking at where moisture could get in. And so they would use a little bit of export so re resin to cover up any of the the screw so no moisture can get in there and it's that attention to detail that by having early involvement with Arabs and Foster we were able to really go into every little nook and cranny and think what about this and try and uh, get that and that's something we always say to people especially architects and engineers come and talk to us early as a manufacturer and an installer we will give you our ideas on things. We don't pretend to have all the answers, but what we can give you is a perspective from a manufacturer and an installer. And so when you're looking at these items, we can tell you what will work and what won't, try different ideas. Because th this is, the devil's in the detail with, with glue lamb, or like with any of these complex structures. Um, there's a lot of testing and a lot of trying out, and this is what's going on here. The guys are making a test plate 
Um, and it is a test one. The, the welding on there, someone on a previous thing had sort of said, is that welding? But it, is, it was just for a test plate. The normal ones have got a continuous weld, in case anyone's wondering. Um, being an Austrian factory, the guys there are not your normal animals that you find in factories in the UK. All these guys are, are trained technicians, so they know that a machine is sharp and not to put your hands in it. So they, their health and safety is different to UK. I mean, VHAG have a, one of the best health and safety records ever uh, of any sort of company in terms of manufacturing on site. Uh, but that's just something to note, really. They don't have loads of PPE on. Lots and lots of nodes. These are the steel nodes. It looks a bit like out of Star Wars, all those X-Fighters, I always think, are, are on there. And you think, how do you control all of these? When you think m most of those are all different, and it's really having a very advanced logistics programs. Every item is barcoded, and so it's, you can control it just in time delivery. You can imagine something like Canary Wharf. There's no room for putting all loads of storage. So we use these very advanced systems to enable just in time delivery, every piece. And it helps as well with the sustainability tracking for chain of custody. Really important um, on these complex structures. You couldn't do it manually with the amount of items there and the speed of installation. Everything has to be, uh, you know, just in time, just right, because if something isn't right and the guys have to stop, it can be catastrophic from the programming point of view. So it is really key. Uh, yeah, the size of nodes, they're big, big nodes. You think it's a timber structure, but the amount of steelwork in there, I mean, it's the biggest value timber package ever placed in the UK. It runs in several million. And the steelwork was a big chunk of that. Um, and you can see the complexity of each node as it's got all these plates coming off at different angles to form this grid shell uh, roof there. So they're sitting there waiting to go up. Um, yeah, logistics was a real key to this. Um, as well as being complex uh, from a design point of view, it it's really is a, a difficult place to get to, very tight site and everything. So that was something that we had to put a team on there uh, to, to, there's be a project manager with the team and every time there'd be several guys just based in the office there on site for programming and logistics. That's when we inherited the site there, traditional as you'd imagine sort of concrete and steel box uh, and so we started installing it in the autumn a couple of years ago and it was installed through the wet and windiest record, uh, winter on record uh, on there, and so you imagine a timber structure would be a total disaster, all water stains and that, but as you'll see, that wasn't the case. Uh, one of the things with this building in triangles, they're really strong shapes, so you don't need a lot of propping and, and, and scaffolding, which again means faster installation. Uh, the guys, they use cherry pickers, scissor lifts, and you can see the guys there, very small team there, only half a dozen or so are on there. All of them, the you know, guys that have been either directly employed or working with us for years uh, on there. So that we hired them a flat sort of for six months down on site so they could be there. Um, and you can see them bolting together the pieces that went up, really sort of started in the middle and worked your way out. So health and safety was the real key. Canary Wharf couldn't afford any bad press apart from the the human misery of anything going wrong. So everything had to have really elaborate method statements and risk assessments for every activity uh, on there. And you can see the type of modern plant we use for giving you working at heights is quite is brilliant for helping this, this process go up. Uh, and you can see this has gone up quite a way without any sort of propping on it uh, on there. You sort of try and build over. And you can see the, the amount of water on the, the place. Our guys are mainly ger from Germany and Austria for erecting, and they're used to cold weather, but they were saying it was worse because it's very cold and damp. So they had to go out and buy different types of protective clothing, sort of soft shell, because uh, the normal stuff wasn't any good. So you try and make as much stuff up on the deck, so we're lifting in the last bit there for the guys. They've now got some propping up there as you go up there, and they just lift it into place uh, and just bolt it in. And because all it's all designed using computer software, everything was within a couple of mil. But if it wasn't, you'd be stuffed really. You can't say, oh, we'll just get a saw out and, and trim it up because it's, it's engineered to the nearest millimetre um, on there. And there, the, once that's 
part was you've got that first bit done. It's a sort of few. It works. Now we can sort of work out uh, backwards uh, to either end. Yeah, it's it's a big one, and these sort of dog legs come down. It's it's a big space to work on, um, and it's not just a roof. As you can see, how far it comes down with these dog legs. And you can see the guy on the top there as they go along. Uh, in terms of height, if you were to lay number one Canada Square on its side, that's about how long it is, sort of 300 metres. It's a, it's a long roof. Um, the propping going up there. Just the node in place now. It's, you know, rather than hide it away, make a feature of it. So it's, it really, you can get a good idea of what it's like. Galvanised. Uh, generally, all the steel work we do is galvanised because it gives that, that design life on there. Uh, I mean, that was in December we went there. We'd been in, meeting in town and we popped there. And that's the biz... I mean, the Crossrail is the biggest construction project since the war, uh, as I understand. And our guys were the only ones working there at half five still. Everyone else had gone home and they were still working away, still cheerful in the rain. You can get, start getting an idea now of the flashing that's going up there for the open areas uh, on there. As, as timber, you've got to keep it dry and keep it... not in, so it's sitting in water. One of the key things with this is this ETFE, these roofing pillows, which they, Eden Project's probably the most common uh, use of it. Uh, and the interface with our part of it, the structure is so complex that what we did was us and Seeley, the guys that did that, we offered a single warranty to the end client so that, God forbid, if there's anything wrong with the structure, they've got one point of contact. And that's something we see moving forward as being really important to offer that single warranty and we work really close with Sealy because the way their product interfaced with ours, we shared desks with them on site uh, and really worked together so that when the whole shell came together, there wasn't this normal thing of people blaming each other. Everyone's working together. And that's, you know, we've learned a lot from on this project and this collaboration, both at design stage with the design team, early involvement, and then on site with the other trades is really key for these big projects to make them really fly. Yeah, you get an idea now uh, of the open areas of very much... Uh, so the items that are open to the elements are flashed. The timber used is spruce. They could have had a more expensive durable timber, but cost is the driver. So where it's going to be exposed, it's, it's flashed with a, quite an expensive flashing, which Sealy did along with the ETFE. You get an idea of scale there. And this was just taken on the train going round on the DLR as it was going up. It was quite nice sitting on the train here in Londoners. Normally when a new structure's going up, everyone's very dismissive of them. But they were quite intrigued with this because you'd never see anything like this in the centre of London. Normally it's just another concrete uh, building. So everyone was very interested with this um, uh, on there. Yeah, architecturally, you can get an idea from the inside. Uh, at the complications at the end, it cantilevers 30 metres out over the water in each end. Uh, and so from a, first of all, a design point, to make a roof that will cantilever that is one thing. And secondly, to build the, the blooming thing is another. So um, as it's gradually coming out there, uh, VHAG, we built a temporary platform for our uh, big uh, cherry pickers to sit on. And we had to provide a couple of monster... Uh, mobile cranes because the tower cranes wouldn't reach. Uh, so that was again part of our package. And of course we made this temporary platform out of timber uh, on there. And the, this type of grid shell with the triangles is so strong that the steel reinforcing hoop didn't go on till afterwards. The structure just cantilevered out there and on there. You can get an idea of it looking down there and just seeing how much it is sticking out. And um, yeah, quite a logistics challenge really but it, it went off without a hitch and we were just there on the last day seeing the last bit going in and it was very much like an aerial ballet really as um these just these guys coming in totally silent just hearing the just seeing the guys sort of moving it a bit forward and and back it, it's always nice watching other people work when you don't have to um so we're standing there on the railing watching it on a sunny day um yeah and then the, the steel arch just goes in to sort of complete it the etfe comes out uh, and the roof was closed in. I mean, it was a six-month installation period, uh, say, during the wettest and windiest rec winter on record, but the timber, because what you have to try and do is think ahead, and what we did was treat the timber 
to stop moisture damage and fungal damage and insect damage. I mean, they actually predict that termites could get to the UK in its lifespan, so it's treated against termites. And it's that thinking ahead that you have to do. And so in the factory, we, we did a... You can't vacuum impregnate glue lamb, so you do surface coatings. And so what this will enable is... It's also got a UV coating, so you won't get this horrible fading. So it's tried to think ahead to give the lifespan, because no one's going to be really able to get up there and do much in the way of decorating without a lot of fuss. So you've tried to make it do as much as you can in the factory uh, for it. The timbers generally are straight in section, but a few of them are double curved, sort of twisted, to form this amazing shape. Uh, and to do that in timber doesn't actually cost any more than making straight members, whereas, of course, in steel, it's a different story. So it forms this very unusual shape as you're looking out there. Yeah, I mean, what as well is unusual, at the end of a job like this, normally you'd be expecting with the contractor to have a bit of a few arm wrestles about cost and things like that. But this one, the project manager, Andy, was very happy with what we've done and very happy to show people round. We finished sort of on, on target and on budget, and um, it's quite unusual with projects of this size. Um, this was, as I say, one of the initial sketches on there, and again, having been in the industry like yourselves a few years, it's very unusual to see that and then see the reality as being similar. Normally, especially you as architects, have an idea, and then what the finished product like, you think, oh, I wasn't expecting this, disappointed. It's got all bolts, it's got all steel, I don't like it. And I think the route that they took down this, having this competition and getting someone involved, manufacturers early, really helped. Because if this had gone down the traditional route, where a main contractor had been allowed to do whatever he liked, I think it would end up a bit like Lanston Car Park, which, look, it's got a bit of foliage, it's got a bit of timber. No disrespect to Cornwall, but that's what often happens when people just get fixated with a bottom line price. Whereas with this project, it finished ahead of schedule, on budget, and to the quality that the client wanted and the design that the architect and the engineers wanted. Uh, and it just shows that you can, with a bit of thinking out, you know, thinking differently rather than just this obsession with bean counters, looking at the bottom line, you can get what you want and it won't cost you any more. Timber's not the answer to everything, but in the right environment, like something like this, it's not going to have to have any maintenance because it's not affected by this sort of very wet and wind sort of environment it's in. Uh, and it's given... I mean, if you have a look down there, there you'll see already it's, um, it's going to change that whole area because at the moment it's very glass and steel, but it's, it's going to make it into something else. It's opened at the start of mail and they've made it out to be like some sort of ship there, which I thought was really funny um, uh, on there. there um, but they're having all concerts and that, and it, to me, it seems to be they're, bringing pe they're starting to look at people for the first time, and the timber is very much more of a welcoming sort of place there. Uh, and so it's already we're starting to see from this, other architects and engineers and clients are starting to say, look, I want to make a feature with this. It's going to draw people in. Can we use timber? And we're starting to see inquiries coming in, and we say, please talk to us. We love getting this early engagement. We can do sketches, we can give you an idea of cost. Uh, so, you know, come and have a chat with us, really. Um, uh, and we can help you create something like this, really. Have you still got openings in the, in the roof? Yeah. yeah, for sure, and, yeah. There's big, big openings, yeah. trees poking out of them. That's what I thought. Isn't that going to lead to some ongoing maintenance problems, well, moisture-wise? You're, you're quite right. If it had just been, sorry, if it had just been left as timber, then it would be but they flashed it on three sides of the timber, so there's only the bottom piece of timber exposed, and the flashing used is a really complicated, expensive, engineered item so that the moisture cannot get trapped during the building's lifespan. So, yeah, it would be. If it was just timber, it would be, it'd be vulnerable with a species like spruce. So, no. And the trees that have been planted inside, inside I take it, you've taken into account that in 40, 50, 60 years' time, they might be a shade taller than they are now. Yeah, they can poke out the top. I mean, it's, it's a mad thing, because the trees are put up there like 12 metres high. They're not like little, little saplings. They're fully grown trees. It's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. How does the irrigation work? 
like obviously the drainage from all the plants how does that work yeah. and incorporated that yeah i mean etfe uh, the pillows like you get at the eden project they're just like giant cushions of air with uh, with plastic and then where they meet you have a flashing over the top of them so it forms a complete barrier and any water runs off um so it's an extraordinary thing to see really uh and it's has to give that design life for 40 years uh, on there so everything's been each element of where each one meets something else as the guys have sat down and worked it out how's it going to work will it let water in let's do a test and it's all very much tried and tested technology. You know, you go to the Eden Project, it's been there for a good few years, and they've learnt, and you have to use, when you see the guys there that were fixing it, they're very highly trained technicians fixing it, because it's very complicated, this ETFE, and we worked with them to make sure it all fitted, so there wasn't any moisture traps, and that any water can get off. But it will be interesting to see where some of these holes are when the wind blows, if the water does come in a bit on, on the side, on the inside, but the timber itself, a little bit of water, it's got this moisture treatment on it, so it will just run off, and any of the end bits of it, because timber's a load of tubes really, and so the end bits are, are capped off. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll just bring that. Just to say, I mean, keep, keeping the wood dry is important. Um, what I believe in doing is in the first six months of any project where there's any risk of rain getting on the wood, actually just going when it's raining and when it's windy and actually having a look. And we, do, we did that very much here. So after the flashing was on, we did some pretty rigorous um, uh, sort of water hose testing if you like. And based on that, we actually adapted some of the flashing designs. I think you can imagine here, because those holes are not just overhead, but actually they come down the sides. So actually putting the flashing on, on, on the three sides of the wood, actually, as those bits of wood start to... That doesn't quite work quite so well. So we did work quite carefully on this. But it is just, I mean, there's a lot of times when um, people have come along to me and, and, and they're they're looking to have an external timber structure. I really must emphasize that in the UK climate, unless you are prepared or unless your client's prepared to replace those structural elements after 15 or 20 years, you simply must not put the structure, your structural members outside. And I emphasize structural members because if those members rot and fail, we're talking about a safety issue. Um, I'm very happy to have timber cladding where if it does decay slightly, that's, you, you know, that's, that's just a maintenance issue, but we, we can't really take safety risks. Um, so there is one exception, which is that there is, a, as, as John alluded to, there is a, a chemically modified wood called a coir, which is for the first time we have something which, is, which has structural strength and it can be glued and it's completely rot resistant. Um, so there is there is an option, but it, it inevitably with, with, with a chemically modified wood, it's there there is a cost to that. So for your general projects, we're generally for, e for reasons of economy, we're using the spruce that that we used here, um, and so really you, you just really must keep your structure inside in the dry. Thank you for coming along and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Cheers. <laughs>